that will give you that. Oh, that's okay. The question answer there. So, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, we're just getting set up here, but um, yep, thank you all very much for joining us here on our second meeting of the 2020 21 calendar for the Orkney Disc uh, Agriculture Discussion Society meetings. And um, we're delighted to have Peter Tate here um, to tell us about 150 years of Chain W Tate. But before um, I'll introduce Peter, um, I'd just like to mention that um, we have a well, the sad passing of uh, Ken Watson uh, last week. Ken was an active member uh, in the Orkney agricultural community and um, he was a very enthusiastic supporter of the Discussion Society. Um, he sat on the committee for a number of years and he played an active role supporting a lot of um, trips and organising trips with the committee. And uh, also then he sat as the president from 1990 to 91. Um, and also he was uh, the first non-Arcadian president of the NFU in Orkney as well. Um, oh. If anyone would like to pay their respects, um, there's a, a, the hearse is going to be doing a route um, tomorrow and there's plenty of space at the mart, um, so the route is going to go, um, it's leaving the John Cors funeral home at approximately 20 past 11 tomorrow and uh, it's going to travel up the Gleitness Road and uh, out the old Fencing Road past the Renovester and then turn right back and past the mart, so there's space to park the car at the mart and to stand on the verge to pay respects there. Um, so tonight uh, we have Peter here from uh, HNW Tates. Uh, we're delighted to have him here to speak and we've got a really good uh, evening photos here for you all to see. And um, we've got a lot of participants. We've got 101 participants here tonight as well. So thank you all very much for joining us. What we're going to do is Peter's going to talk with a presentation with his uh, photos. And then at the end, we'll have a question and answer session at the end. So there's um, a question and answer option. If you look on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A and you'll see two speech bubbles. So if you have a question to ask, um, if you type your question in there, it'll come up and then I can take note of it for the end. And also if there's somebody asked a question that you think is really important, you can also upvote it so that the questions go to the top. But any questions, type them on there and then at the end of the meeting, I'll ask Peter. So without much further ado, I'd just uh, like to thank Peter for your speaking and just then um, pass you on to Peter. Okay, well, thank you very much for everybody coming to this meeting of the OEDS on the 30th of November. Um, this is a brief history of JWT, limited 1870 to 2020, 2020 being our 150th anniversary. Okay, this photograph here is James Tate, who was born in 1850 and came from Ingstack, done it in Caithness. His father William had a farm at Quantumus St Ola and at the Boo of Campston in Tobe. William, as his father was before, was a cattle dealer. And James started his business as ironmongers. The business was started in 1870 in a cellar below the house at the bottom of Palace Road. Given his agricultural background, he very soon began to concentrate on supplying farmers with their needs, principally seeds, but then reaping machines in 1876 and manure in 1879. He was a colourful character, a keen swimmer, and his physical strength is legendary. The story goes that he was known to lift a 500 weight barrel of treacle, unaided, from the ground to the countertop, approximately 250 kilos. In 1881, the firm became J&W Tate when he took on a younger cousin, William, into the partnership. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. This one, okay. This photograph shows James Tate seated with the beer and his wife also seated. They had five children. At the back is John, who is the oldest, he studied biology and became a professor at the McGill University in Canada. To his right is Margaret, who married Peter Maxwell of Orkwell Farm. On the left is Jean, who married Ernest Shearer, who were descended from the Stonesy Shearers. The boy sitting in the middle is my grandfather Charles, who subsequently took over the business. And the smallest girl on the right is Sigrid, who died when she was a young girl, I think, probably of TB. William was born in Canis Bay, Caithness, and he was in charge of the firm's travelling shop. 
You're fast of its kind and oddly, this would have been a hostile and shock and was highly successful. In the late 1880s, the firm purchased a hotel at 25 to 27 Broad Street. This was subsequently demolished and they erected a new four-story building in its place. This was a general store and shop on the ground floor. A house on the first floor and the top two floors were divided into flats. This picture um, shows the Broad Street building beside the new town hall. Um, the town hall was built after our building. And this is the building, you know, as it was early in the century. And here's the shop. I don't know who that man is, but um, he's obviously quite happy. Plenty of cigarette adverts in the windows. And um, this picture shows an early shop van, probably in the early 1900s. The picture taken as far as I can see at the head of Scarlet Pier. Notice the wee boys have no shoes. We ran short bands for a long time, I think up until the late 60s. We had a van store down West Tankless Lane where two vans were based and we had an office and a store for goods for the van. Going back to the Bird Street building, this was our main headquarters up until 1997 when our office shifted to Hatston. However, in my lifetime, this was a very busy shop and it became a self-service in the 1960s. This was very successful and we did also, as Tesco's do today, home deliveries. This picture was taken inside the Shelves Shelby shop and chose to manage Mr. Peter Leslie. On his left is my Aunt Margaret, sister of my father and Uncle John. This picture was taken beside a coffee grinding machine, which appeared very popular at the time. In 1883, James's son Charles was born. He was destined for a legal career and had a brilliant first year at Edinburgh University. When his father suddenly became ill and Charles was forced to turn his back on the law and enter the family business. He was just 23 years old and the firm was on the verge of a dramatic expansion as the speed of progress in agriculture in Orkney gained a pace. Also the event of World War I and the development of Scarlet Flow as Britain, Britain's naval base created a large demand for all food products, beef, mutton, vegetable, and eggs. At this time, Charles formed a business partnership with his sister Margaret's husband, Peter Maxwell of Hartwell, to supply the Navy fleet with meat. As a slight deviation, here is a picture of a horse ploughing march in the front park at Orkle Farm. Obviously very well attended. And judging by the cars and the trees, which I know well, I guess around 1912. James, the founder, died in 1910, and William retired to Midgarth Farm in Stonesea at the end of World War I leaving Charles in charge. Here's a photograph of my father calling him Uncle Dodd on an Austin tractor with steel wheels towing a grubber. The firm branched out into the grocery business in 1918 and grew to be one of the largest companies in Orkney, perhaps rivaled only by our garden before the disastrous fire in 1938, and by James Fletton's sons. Charlie, who lived at Buckwai House, conducted grass seed trials in the surrounding fields to develop new products. When World War II broke out, the firm took over the Kirkwell Slaughterhouse and obtained the contracts to supply meat and vegetables to the fleet in Scalper Flow. Charlie married Mary Eisfister, 
whose father was a director of the Glasgow Tobacco Warehouses. Not a popular product these days. And they sent their children to Edinburgh Academy to be educated. It was his custom to visit the wards at Balfour Hospital every fortnight, chatting to patients and giving out fruit. He was a staunch liberal and for a time chairman of the constituency party. Charlie was joined in the partnership after World War II by his sons, William, Billy, John, and Harold Haldy. Haldy tragically died in a drowning accident in Bury in 1958. Billy had served as a glider pilot in the Far East during the war. His first wife, Alison Leonard, died in 1954, and their two boys, Charles, who became a well-known photographer, and myself. Billy, Billy married again in 1967, this time to Miss Jane Maxwell of Hortle Farm, just outside Kepler. Joan was in the Merchant Navy during the war, narrowly escaping death off Nova Scotia when his ship was torpedoed and sank in three minutes. As radio operator, he was the last to leave the ship. Such was his feelings regarding the Navy that he left to join a tank regiment. He married Grace Pottinger from Cleet in Wesley. She was a primary school teacher until she retired to look after the first of her five children, Sigrid Carden, Paul, Ingrid, and Helga. The third son, this is Harold here in these photographs. He was in the paratroopers and was involved in the reoccupation of France. He married Elsie Blass from Instably in Sandwick and Together they had five children, Leslie, Billy, Erlen, Norna, and Harold. The youngest died shortly after birth. This picture is taken by Father Billy in this office in Broad Street, which overlooked the cathedral and was a very nice situation. Very popular with the women in the office because they could watch all the weddings and all the funerals and see who was asked and see who wasn't asked and who didn't turn up. <laughs> I moved him. Hatston cured that. Um, the second one is of my father at his ease in a garden in Balfour Village, Shapensea, in the summertime. The next two are of my Uncle John, I think, taking during meals at Thomaston Mill, where we used to go for annual general meeting meals. This one is from both at a cousin's wedding. After the Second World War, the firm got more deeply involved in farm machinery and equipment, as can be seen in this picture taken in a back store yard which is a truck laden with a new forts and tractor and a new plough, obviously all set to be delivered on farm. Post-war, during the big modernization and heavily grant-aided development of agricultural land, tractors and machinery became in great demand. We sold, this is after the war, principally David Brown and International, David Brown at this time was a very forward moving company and the tractors were very popular. This series of photographs show in our hangout at Hatston, which had been kitted out as a workshop. We had a week where employees from David Brown tractors came up and serviced customers tractors in the hangar. So it was a service week. It was much appreciated by the farmers. Um, and in this photograph, number three, shows a group of farmers and the staff from David Brown tractors present on the runway at Hatston. You can see if you're looking into the distance, there's nothing behind the hangout apron and the sea except air raid shelters on the shore. A huge change from now. This photograph's 
the, shows the gentleman white, Stuart Dingle, who for a long time came to Orkney, and he was a service representative for David Brown Tuckers. The man in the middle is Mr. Robertson of Liking Farm in Sandwick. I don't know who the other farmers are, but perhaps somebody watching will know. This part of Hartson, the RDF houses, which are all now demolished, but were council houses for a long time after the war and were a huge asset to Kirkwood County Council at the time. Very few buildings in this. The firm bought two huge aircraft hangars at Hudson Aerodrome in the late 50s and early 60s. This enabled us to store large quantities of fertilizer, which at that time were principally basic slag and ground magnesium limestone. These were used for the rejuvenization and neutralization of thousands of acres of hill which would be developed into agricultural grassland. This was greatly aided by government support. In 1967, Charlie died suddenly, leaving a vacuum at the top of the firm. His death, coupled with incomplete will and subsequent death duties, placed the business in a precarious position for a number of years. Barry, who was in charge of the farming side of the business, became chairman. A cousin, his picture is seen here, Harold Shearer, who had been a magistrate in Bazoot Land, came back to Orkney when Kenya became divorced from the UK. He became company secretary. Uncle John was in charge of the garage selling tractors, agricultural equipment, cars and vans. Here is a picture of an early Morris car, which is probably 1930s, but it's quite interesting. Belonging to Arthur Flett, the Flett and Sons, we sold Morris cars, which went on to be BMC cars, which went on to be Austin Rover, which went into demise. So we started selling Volkswagen. Today, although we don't have a full franchise, we still quite a lot of new Volkswagens, Isuzu pickups and Land Rovers. With the increased use of farming, fertilizers and slag, was good business for JW Tate and the firm arranged shipments of slag and lime directly from south or even from the continent to customers in the islands to reduce transport costs. Most of these cargoes came on little coasters there were lots of little coasters and probably carried anything from the three to 450 tons, which doesn't seem a lot these days, but it was a lot then. Some of the ships that went to this route were local. There was the Elbert Bay Shipping Company, the Robin Denison, the Helmsdale, the Shetland Trader, besides other boats like the Fern Dean, probably around 10 or 12 coasters supplying the coast about that time. Here is a picture of the Illit Bay, one of these coasters, the picture in Stromness Harbour discharging a load of coal. Lots of coal came out at this time, some of it direct to the North Isles as well. Uh, here's a photograph of the guy that drove the crane for a couple of years. Interesting job. We got around and saw places on the continent, Rotterdam, Antwerp, Ghent, and places in the South England, the Thames, Seaham, Hull, Goul, Newcastle, Berwick and Tweed, and the West Coast, um, Stornoway. We would have never seen them otherwise. Very interesting at that time. Lots of fishing boats and just lots of coastal traffic. Here's a picture of lime being discharged from Kirkwell Pier. By the pier crane with a bucket into the back of one of the party builders maroon lorries. They had quite a big fleet at this time and did a lot of contracting. 
Here's another photograph. This is Fison's fertilizer coming off there at bay. And there's a three doctors. Um, the guy facing us with his hand up is Mr. Bob Muir, who is one of the head doctors at the time. With the advent of large amounts of slag and, and ground limestone being applied, JNW Tate's got involved with supplying the spreading service. This consisted of tractors and Atkinson lime spreaders and would go anywhere. They would be equipped with a crane on the back so you could lift half a ton, i.e. 10, 50 kilogram bags in one go. This picture shows a David Brown 990 with suitably equipped front end weights, discharging slag and the home of between Lousy and Eaglesy. This was an endeavor we were quite happy to do. On the boat, you can see my father on the left, Andy Monroe in the center, who was at that time Grieve of Scotness Farm in Lousy, and on the right is the late Mansi Flores. He operated the shipping company between Lousy, Eaglesy, Wire, and Tengla. Driving the tractor is Geordie Rendell, and in the background is the family boat, the Shalder, which accompanied Mansi Flores' boat, the Sula. Here we are on Homer Scorpness again. The pile of slag, which has been set on the beach, and I think the guy on the beach is Hamish Daly. The two boats were both built by Duncan, are very similar, and it's obviously full of wee boys at this time. This would have been around 1967. Here's a picture of her 1948 Duncan of Barry Belt. Shalder today. Built with Johnny, John and Billy's D more money from World War II. Um, this picture shows an unhappy Ian Flores in the home of Scotland. With the front axle broken off, it's Marcy Ferguson 65, obviously the result of hitting a ditch. Not the easiest location for such an accident than to happen. Hence this happy loop. The next two pictures are also of a home of Scotland. Now, the following set of pictures show, in addition to the slag splitting operation, which was a lorry with the movable platforms. The theory being that you loaded the lorry, delivered the platform onto location, usually loaded with slag, the platform left, and the spreaders come along at a convenience and load themselves, and the lorry could go back to the base to reload and come back with another load and take the empty platform away and so on. This picture shows two tractors and spreaders. Tractors were not big. The one in the foreground is probably 44 horsepower, and the one at the back was a really big tractor, and it's a B450, huge. It was considered to be far too big for Orkney, and it was 59 horsepower. We still have this tractor today in very good order. We also go into direct drilling of grass seed, and this particular one you can see is in Hoy. There's a peagle bottom in front, and we are direct drilling into the hill. A person in the foreground is Roy Johnston, this was a more uni drill and worked very well and created a lot of grass in Orkney. We had it for a lot of years. This is a lorry with an aluminium body, 1950s vintage. Another modern invent invention because it has a crane and can load and discharge itself. The crane is extendable. This was a very modern innovation at the time. Okay, we now have a couple of pictures of the Denison boat, the Cabasark, being discharged from Kirtwood Pier by the pier crane, and this is feeding stuff. We had to take feeding stuff this way as it's the only economical way to do it. But of course, you had to take a lot of it at one time. It's been loaded onto one of our lorries. We had two eight-wheel lorries, and they both ran up and down the road 
after it went to the Lolo Ferry in the mid 80s. During the 1960s and 70s, JMW Tate developed its presence around the huts and hangars and subsequently became headquartered here in 1997. Hudson at this time, I mean the 1960s and 70s, was evolving to be the industrial area of Kirkwall. Many farms were here, were to, were to relocate here. Yet the inches of space to expand accessibility and parking were great. As well as slag splitting, we got involved in other types of contracting. Combine harvest hunting was one. And here I have a picture of four of our combines working in one field at Ork. Wow. This photograph shows three lorry loads of plot corn arriving. This was one of the first deliveries we had off the Roro Ferry St. Ola, which I was introduced, I think, in 1976. And it made the transportation of goods from Scottish mainland or UK mainland much easier. As this plot corn came from Hull, it made the whole um, distribution thing much more easy. Notice in the background, the only thing you see between the apron at Hudson and the shore is six early shelters from the war time. Notice also behind the lorry is a flock of geese. These geese were very common in Orkney at that point in time. We got, also got involved in agricultural contracting. And here you see some pictures, early pictures of a day around 1412, which is a big, big title at that time. And beside that, a 484 was a buck rate partner. At this time, we'd be using kid double chops, not the fastest machine today's time, but an awful lot faster than the side mounted JFs and that type of thing. This photograph shows the David Brown 1690 cutting silage and an 880 pulling a trailer beside it. This was a big outfit in its day and probably deemed to be much too high capacity for Orkney. We progressed from class precision chop onto the self propelled precision chop. This is seen at the college farm, Roy Johnston driving. A 685, which must have been all of 70 horsepower, pulling an eight ton trailer. A 70 horsepower tractor these days would be deemed to be a buyer tractor. This is the very first of the self propelled precision chop. It was a class 70 SF, and I think it would have been around 1983. The next picture here is an international 784, shows a rapid horsepower progression, and as well as being 80 horsepower, it is four wheel drive. Absolutely another innovation, great. In 1996, we progressed even further. We have a new 820 chopper and an 860 unit with a 30 foot mower on the front and also a big rake, which could rake 30 feet. This increased our output tremendously. The chopper could pick up 10 acres an hour and David Grieve driving the big mower and rake he could mow and rake in front of the chopper. One man doing two jobs, and the whole thing is really efficient. You see um, that the mower has a really heavy swath. And one of the advantages of that mower was it left the whole thing spread completely over the field and it wilted very fast. There was only need to rake it. Going back to combine harvesters, here's a picture of the first new combine harvester we sold, which would be around 1984. It is a Centre 85, and it's seen loaded on the island of boat to go some cattle to Shafty. The centre was sold from Messrs. Muir and Sons, gone, and was a very modern machine in its day. 
carrying on with combine harvesters. We now have some photographs which I will explain. This past one here is a picture of three combines which sold in 2013. They look quite nice standing beside each other. The next picture here was taken at the county show two more machines and a self held Jaguar, customers being Mrs. Brown and Hackland and Mr. Chalmers of Upper Lea. This is taken pre county show that year. This photograph shows both the Chalmers machines with the Chalmers brothers taken pre county show that year. The Jaguar 850 and the Combine at Tucana 430. This photograph shows a proud Alison and me before the show. Very happy with the show. This picture here was taken, must have been the previous year, and there's a farmer's visit we had to the big show in Germany called Agritechnica. We also had a tour of the class factory. This was very impressive and we all enjoyed it. All the farmers there enjoyed it too. On the extreme right is the late Mr. John Brown, who purely by coincidence was walking through the great big showroom and he met the managing director of class, Mr. Helmut Class. They were both delighted. As you can see from the next picture, we continued to enjoy the trip on the way back. And um, here we are. Um, on this um, enjoying trips, here are some guys in Boot Hill Cemetery, um, Dodge City, Kansas, where we happen to visit. And here's some more. Getting involved with supplying of feed and fertilizer has meant we had to have more transport. So here's a series of photographs showing a fleet of transport we would have had about five years ago. I suppose the main difference, um, I suppose the main difference, feed comes in in bulk and goes out in bulk and most farmers want it delivered in bulk or collected in bulk. The other one is have a lorry load of pallets and we'll date back to when we had an awful lot of fertilizers that still came in pallets and we had to put pallets back and this created great difficulty as we never got back so many pallets as we supplied. The final photograph um, shows an unusual load we had at one point. This was an Islander plane which crashed in one of the North Isles and it had to go back to the factory. The man instrumental in a long distance haulage was Vincent Sinclair from business. He is seen in the pictures as a long distance haulage operated countrywide for many years and was operated by the man in the photograph, a well-traveled and competent busy man. By the time we relocated to Hartston, a different generation of Tates could come into the business. This is me. The current management team consists of Peter, Billy Sun, Billy Sun and Haldi. And this is taken to Billy. This is obviously um, pre-1997, but the view is nice. Well, off his look directly on the cathedral. And also my daughter, Alison, who is now fifth generation to manage the firm. Also directors, Karen Burns and Mark Johnston. Peter is managing director and is married to Anne from Renfrew. And we have um, four children, just Alison in the business. I have been involved with the firm all my life, except after leaving KGS when I worked for a couple of years in a coaster with the Elliott Bay Shipping Company, along with Bill and Sylvia Dennison. With the addition of learning seamanship, I almost also learned to cook. Billy, who takes charge of the feed and fertilizer sale, is also educated in Kirkwell and went to university in Aberdeen, where he gained a BSc. He intended to become a teacher, but his uncle Billy, who died in 2011, persuaded him to join the business. Billy Jr. is married to Jane Glue, a local talented artist. 
John Stotter, shown here, Cara, managed his spare parts department for around 20 years. Harley's other son, Erland, ran the garage up until 2005. The following photographs will show some differences we have made in Hudson over the years. The photograph here will be 1978 and shows the construction of our new garage, which consisted of a building a part store, a showroom and offices at one end of the hangar, putting in a mezzanine floor, which as you can see is a very substantial affair to allow us to have a grass seed and mixing storage space upstairs. This worked very well. This photograph here shows a man from a company called Hartledge installing a brake tester, which became a necessary tool for MOT testing. Looking on our employees at the time, Hugh Gibson, workshop foreman, and Andrew Kirkness, head mechanic. The next two supporters show Billy Craigie and Rodney Garner, two long term employees, up in the hang of the roof, re cladding it. This obviously hadn't been done before World War II, which is quite a long time ago. Both were really keen workmen and could do anything at all. You'll also notice the lack of buildings around us. Here are two more photographs of some employees. First one against Mr. Rodney Grandin, looking very fresh. He was with us a long, long time and was manager of the hangar. Second one is Mr. Alistair Shearer, who worked with us for a long, long time too, and he ran our grass seed mixing operation very successfully from Junction Road and luckily from the new mezzanine floor in the hangar. And here is Mr. Dennis Gree, also a very good long term prominent employee. Um, very capable. He was manager in the hangar after Rodney. His son David has followed in his footstep and is now a long term manager as well. Here he is, here's David. <clears throat> Modern times, JW Tate's properties have been developed, including a number of multiple feed. Feeding stuff bins, all electronically controlled and mechanically operated. Plus a series of ground silos, both of which enable the handling of distribution of bulk animal feed stuffs. This is a long way from hundredweight bags of the past. We supply feed products manufactured from Harbour Farm and Feeds in Tallaght, Aberdeen, and there have been a long and successful partnership. These Photographs show one set of bins installed and a second set of bins which you got from northeastern farmers. We towed around the road before installation quite a feat. Obviously, the uh, Sunday morning, but all in place now and working very well. Also, the same hangar properties have been able to handle and facilitate the shipment and handling of bulk fertilizers direct from the factory of a premier manufacturer, Yara, in Norway. Which means we can take in full ship loads up to three and a half thousand tons in bulk, discharge it into the big glories at Kirkwood Pier, tip it into a hangar, bag it, and redistribute it. Prior to this operation, which has been going on now for some seven years, supplies from Yara. As for the rest of Scotland, went into Dundee, offloaded in Dundee, bagged, reloaded in the ship, and re delivered to Orkney. This operation would apply probably by truck elsewhere in the country, but the direct importation into Orkney means that the material is handled less and it's there for a better condition. And it should be a better deal for JW Tate's and a better deal for the farmer. There's the stack in March this year, quite a big stack. And this is the machine that bags it. It comes up from Aberdeenshire. 
And there's the space before the stack of fertilizer. Okay. Here is a photograph of Hudson Industrial Estate from the air. Taken, we think, around 1977. And you can see if you study the picture, only new buildings in this picture are Andersinkness New Shade and the Autark Factory. All the remainder are war time. No sign of the new mark or the new road, nothing on the shoreline. There's a lot happened in the last 40 years. In the last 40 years, the firm has developed a substantial property portfolio of both commercial and domestic buildings at Hatston and in the centre of Kirkwell. Here is one, this is like the Scottish Sea Farms. This was built new for Streamline Shipping Company, as was the building below it. The one below is now occupied by RGC Engineering. Both a big warehouse. The one next door is occupied by Rexel, which is formerly a Lerwick company, but now bought over by Rexel, who are wholesale electrical suppliers. The third one here is a wholesale warehouse, plumbers and kitchens. This is William Wilson, another big national company who rent this building from us. Next door is Highland Industrial Supplies, and they've been here for several years. On top of this, we have several units in town. We have two taxi garages, a hairdresser, a computer office, a company called Thor Orkney, Restart Orkney, and Judith Glue. We also built a bulk of new holiday apartments in 2008 in Broad Street Gardens behind Broad Street. Here are some photographs of the units in construction. They were built by Andrew Wilson, a company which is now defunct. However, the building method was very, very good and they made all these individual pods and the pods were then built together so each unit is independent and fully insulated. Very soundproof, very proof, and very good. So these three photographs show the block under construction, and the last one shows the building taken from Tankman's House Gardens. So a total of these properties include some 18 units based in Hudson Industrial Estate and Kirkwell Town Centre. The involvement too in both domestic and four star holiday lets has been a great success thanks to Allison. With six domestic units and since 2009, 12 holiday lets, which are busy normally. However, this year has not been good due to the COVID. No takers from March to August. Currently, we're um, in the process of developing a further few sites in Hearts and Industrial Estate hopefully for future industrial expansion. The firm employs 28 people, 60 in 1970, and computerization has had a major impact on how the company operates. We first became, we first became computerized in 1983. This led to a much more efficient stock control, sales and ordering process. Also, up-to-date sales accounts and accountant reports making a much more successful company. We have a very proficient accountant, Karen Burns, who has been with us for quite a long time and is now company director. The consolidation of Hortley Farms has changed for the firm's customer base. For example, um, in 1972, there are 93 farms in Westley. Now there are 32. Generally, I also believe in the value of customer contact and currently employed two full-time agricultural salesmen, Fraser Moore and David Fraser. Both are well known in the agricultural industry. GNW Tate also supply a large range of modern agricultural equipment and hold franchises for Case, Class, Cavernan, Manitou, NC, Major, Marshall, and several others. 
We run a service and construction engineering shop, ably run by Alan Taylor, and a well equipped workshop and staff, our on site workshops and parts facilities, as well as a mobile service van on hand. Our garage manager is Mark Johnston, who is also now a company director. In our garage department, we sell mainly Volkswagen, Isuzu, and Land Rover. Our sales manager is Richard Wiley and has been with us a long time. Here's a picture taken earlier this year with Alton Taylor and David Newlands. Um, this was taken in March on the occasion of the presentation of 30 years service awards. Thank you very much. We also sell ATVs and garden equipment and hold the Honda and EP Barris franchises. We specialize in the service and repair of all vehicles. We also offer a collection and delivery service for lawnmowers, self propelled or walk behind. This is carried out from a modern well equipped workshop overseen by former Mr. David Newlands and staffed by fully trained and fully competent staff. While the tendency these days uh, for fewer large farms, we still retain a large customer base reflected by the number of customer calendars we send out, somewhere around 1,500. So we are grateful for the loyal support we received from all our customers and look forward to being a service to the Orkney community for another 150 years. A business is only as successful as its staff it employs JNW Tate have been very fortunate with their staff. The company wishes to thank all the staff, both past and present, for their wholehearted efforts over the lifetime of the business. So, thank you very much. That's me. Um, any questions, just ask. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Peter. That is fantastic. Um, a great range of pictures and fantastic uh, record over the years of full business. I think it's great you've got that. And um, great to see right back and see the way it's changed yeah. in, in Orkney. Um, so like uh, Peter said there, we've got questions. Um, please uh, ask any questions you, you've got over the time, over the business. Um, so we've got one here from Evan Sanderson so far straight away. So if you don't know where it is, if you go along the bottom, you'll see Q&A and you can click on that. And then you can type your question and we can ask Peter them. So um, we'll start off with the first question here, Peter. Uh, Mervyn's wondering, when was the first time you spoke at an OEDS meeting and how many do you think you've done now? Oh, I don't know. Um, well, if I've been in the business since um, oh, early 70s, I must have been a dozen OEDSs, must have been. Um, and when strength than another, but it was mo mostly usually take um, company representatives, um, class or Harbour or Yala or Keist. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, brilliant. Yeah, no, it's uh, actually a good night. It's, uh, it's fantastic seeing the history and seeing how the business has uh, evolved and how it came about. It's certainly a business that's grown um, and it's taken a lot of opportunities and a lot of a lot of new directions. Yeah, um, nice, yeah. Uh, I mean, so obviously you've got quite a wide, well, you've got a very wide portfolio of businesses there. Like, so managing that, is it quite a, quite a job to look, to look after them all and keep them all operating? Well, it's quite a job because we're so diverse. We have to take an interest in um, every part of the business mm -hmm. and try and concentrate the ones that are doing best and get rid of the bits that aren't, you know. It's, um... So Brian says here, I remember one Christmas, uh, your father saying in his speech that the shop had sold 40 tonnes sugar and the hangar had sold 4,000 tonnes of slag. That would have been about 1965. So I dare say 40 tonnes of sugar, that's quite a lot, and 4,000 tonnes of slag, so there's no slag coming in now. No. But, uh, <laughs> but how many how many tonnes of fertiliser is it you sell in a year? Is it? Well, it obviously it varies from year to year, but... Um... And that at this point in time, it, it would probably average around about 10,000 tons of fertilizer. It depends on the season. Yeah. yeah. 
some summers you sell none and some summers you might sell 2000 plants just depends on the weather mm -hmm. and that's something i suppose as numbers of farmers have gotten less do you think the business like although there's less farmers now do you think you're for the bigger farms getting bigger do you think you're is it equivalent staying up no no the, the tonnage of fertilizer will go down because the bigger farms become less intensive and in the days of all the little small farms you know under 100 acres or less they're very intensive to make a living i guess Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mike, so somebody's asked a question, what's the difference in the amount of manual you sell compared to the 60s or 70s? So would that be your heyday? Would that be the peak of the 60s and 70s? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Intensification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, um, and that was when you were shipping it yourself, you were loading, or was it? In... Well, that was some early 70s, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's a question from Alan Watt. Uh, the Rover logo consists of a long ship. Where did this originate? Mm -hmm. I don't know that one. Can't tell you that one. So of course you've been Rover dealers when Rover did the advert. We were Rover, yeah. We were Austin Rover. Mm -hmm. So they did they did an advert or not, didn't they? They left a car That's on right. the Yeah, it's to put a rover on the castle of the S to be. Yeah, it was a helicopter, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that'd be quite good for local. It local must business. have been, yeah. Yeah, we had a calendar picture of that. Mm -hmm. That'd be something else, mm -hmm. that. It's um yeah, so well, you, you mentioned in your talk there um, when you're contracting the size of tractors, uh, was it a 56 horse tractor is considered far too big for Orkney? I've had a voice at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, I dare say now you've probably seen one that's quite a bit bigger. Um, I mean, what, what's the biggest kind of size of tractor you've? Oh, I suppose 200 plus. Yeah. I do remember um, um, with White David Brands, we took home our 1200, which I think were 68 horsepower. And she would never sell that. She'd never sell it. And eventually did sell it with some um, Robbie Clark Lingo. He bought it. Mm -hmm. And of course, now it's a very small track now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, um, and do you think, so tractors obviously they've gotten bigger. And do you see any other technology? Have you seen, like, well, you've obviously seen a lot of advancement in technology in farming. Do you, are you seeing future trends coming out on now? Are you seeing? Well, if you're talking about machines, one thing it seems to be coming in more and more is guidance, which um, makes much more efficient application of fertilizer or spray, or, or even when it comes to mowing grass or these type of jobs. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I suppose it'd be better sweet though. So you sell a guidance system, but then uh, if they get more efficient, they're buying less manure then. So it'll be a kind of. Probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so. Oh, that's a good question here as well from Alan. Um, what percentage of your business is on the mainland compared to in Orkney? So I'm wondering if that's the mainland Scotland or is that mainland Orkney compared to the Isles? I mean, the mainland Orkney. Or I mean, so mainland Orkney to the mainland Isles. Mainland Orkney about the Isles, but probably about a third in the North Isles and South Isles. Yeah, a third, roughly. So that's that, yeah. That's a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of, a lot that's of farms. farms in the Isles. A lot of good, intensive farms too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Oh, we've got more questions. Uh, so uh, Colin Flett's asking, how do you see the impact of Brexit and the supply of fertilizer, machinery, and even feedstuffs supplies coming in for the next in the next few months? Have you got? Well, a lot of um, machinery is um, imported from the continent or Republic of Ireland, and um, several of them have told us that the prices will only be um, valid till the end of this year. And we don't know what, if there's going to be import restrictions or tariffs, we don't know. Hopefully, um, as far as fertilizer goes, um, we import our fertilizer direct from Norway. So they're not in the EEC. So hopefully that'll be okay. I, I can't really see it anyway, because um, people want to buy and people want to sell and Putin high tariffs and either uh, isn't any good for anybody mm. yeah yeah but well, so, so hopefully for, me, for christmas rush if you want to get your piece of equipment get in get in now Absolutely, get in yeah. <laughs> so uh, somebody's asking here where do you see machines going in the future well 
because machines seem to be getting bigger and bigger and uh, it's going to be seen in all, a lot of these jobs are now done by contactors because the farmers um, have their work cut out looking after their livestock and they, they don't have time to do a lot of these big jobs. So I think the tendency will only get bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, bigger. And do you think um, well, you're seeing precision agriculture there as well? And do you think it's, uh, it's bigger and just more more accurate and bigger? So it's just more the, accurate and bigger. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a good question as well from Alison and James. And many businesses do not see their 150 year anniversary. Has there been a clear strategy passed down the generations? Well, I would say no. It was not a clear clear strategy at all, but um, we're probably generations have just been fortunate that um, we've had um, members of the, each generation that were keen enough to continue. Mm -hmm. And you've, you've obviously been open to, to um, opportunities as well. I mean, like, there's obviously going into the grocery trade going, there's been many arms and I think that's a, it's obviously a good sign if you can, you, you're, you're not stuck in a certain sector. No, you're but we've to... probably seen that we've gone into New new ventures rather than stick with everything, you know, like grocery shop got overtaken by the supermarkets. Um, even garages are overtaken by huge um, companies in the south. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's a uh, oh, well, it's like you said, um, the, the chain W tape van, I think it's. Is actually very reminiscent of the Tesco vans. I think if you'd, oh, yeah. if you'd stuck it, you should have um, had that one uh, copyrighted and charged yeah. Tesco a bit. Yeah. But uh, mm -hmm. no, it, obviously, um, there's it's gone from full circle. People, it was all it's all centralised, and Absolutely. now it's nearly come full circle back back to home delivery. And it's very interesting. That I know it's not. Yeah, it's come back. Um, we're, we're we're just fortunate in the, that that we're in the agricultural industry, and the, this particular year, and. Um, not affected so badly as a lot of places are. So you can see your shops going out of businesses and restaurants going out of business. It's not not good. Yeah, no, I think it's we do have a lot to be thankful for. I think mm -hmm. indeed, it's uh, we've been able to go about quite quite normally. Um, we have a question here, tongue in cheek, which is always a good sign. Uh, will fertilizer be half price next spring to mark the anniversary? <laughs> no. <laughs> it would look like fertilizer is going to be more expensive next year, but. We'll wait and see, but that's what it looks like. Just, mm -hmm. just to see how I suppose how the end of this month goes, mm -hmm. as well, in, in December goes. Um, see what Boris says. <laughs> mm. I see what people say to Boris. Well, yeah, that's true. It's a. Uh, oh, um, I'll just see here. Uh, I've got so. Yeah, so um, you're in the fifth generation now, obviously, of the business. So it's, yeah, like that question said there. Um, to keep going, you've not got a clear, you've not got a clear strategy, but you've been open new things. And have you found a uh, like? Well, you've seen the holiday late this year. You found that it's been a, a effect. That have you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, and it, it's not good. You would have thought um, holiday letting with if anything was going to be okay, it'd be okay. But there they are. The tourist industry has been decimated. And... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um. I suppose it's. I hope that it will um, come back around. It's yeah. Just in here. Uh, any other questions? Please ask them up. Um, I'm just thinking here. Uh, I've got. I did have some written down, but uh, yeah. No, I think it's been. It's been very interesting to see. Just the. Uh, yeah. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed the photographs. I'm just trying to do a wee bit of history, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's um. Because you were obviously 150 year, you, you are had been hoping to have this open to everybody. So I think it's fantastic you've been able to share this with us tonight. Yeah, um, great. Just a, as well, I suppose you're, you've seen a lot of different changes in farm support and things as well. And um, do you see like when farmers are well supported? Do you see them being? Have you seen changes in farmers' attitudes as markets have changed? Have supporters have supporters changed? Do they? They always buy the base things like feed and fertilizer, obviously, but machines and stuff. Do you see a difference? With schemes coming out? Well, I suppose so, yeah. Well, we have this current scheme now where they're, they're, um, you get need to buy things like dribble bars and, um, and cattle handing equipment. There's been a lot of interest in that. So we'll just wait and see how the grants come. But mm -hmm. yeah. But it's good that they are getting support. 
And uh, but the way things are going, it's going to be environmental. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very well. Yeah, no, it's so you had a lot of interest for dribble bars and for all that Absolutely, equipment. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. no, I think mm -hmm. especially at a place like Orkney with lots of slurry, I think it'll be could be a good course, thing for yeah. us. Mm -hmm. it's, um, mm -hmm. No, let's just check, check here. Oh, hey, another question here. You're a very modest man, Peter. I agree with that. Um, and you head up a great business. That's a credit to yourself and all the staff. Congratulations. Um, and I think it's a very, a very, very valid point. Um, right. Although no holiday lets this year, are folk rebooking for next year instead? Are you seeing folk I think a little bit, yeah. Yeah, I would say so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you'd hope maybe in, in the tourist industry it'll be okay in the country, you know, in Scotland. You'd hope so. People will be holidaying at home. Mm -hmm. Another question here from somebody anonymous. Um, what brand of machinery have you sold the longest? And do you have a favourite? What brand of machinery? Well, if you go back to what I taught, um, the guy James Tate started buying McCormick Reaper sometime about 1870s. So McCormick became bought over by International Harvester that got bought over by Tenneco, which got now belongs to GIKs. So that's probably the longest one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. So are you one of the longest serving dealers? Well, there must be, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the country, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And do you have a favourite? Not especially. I, the, the, the companies vary with the people that run some and you know and how well they run and what they produce. Mm -hmm. It's all very competitive. So all the machinery is entirely competitive. Yeah. Um, here's a question from Gabrielle and Jimmy Bruin. Uh, we've got, how big is the agricultural part percentage-wise of the tape business? Oh. 80%, I would say. Mm -hmm. So it's still pretty much the core. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here's somebody else asking, what franchise would you like to get your hands on yet? Is there anyone see you've got your eye on? I don't know. What about a Tesla? Yeah, well, I've seen you've got an electric car yeah, in. Yeah, I've got an electric car there, yeah. Today. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's a, quite a new model, this. It's a brand new model, the Volkswagen. It's all electric. I think it's got a range of 340 miles, I think you said. A nice little car, really fast. It's um, about the size of a Golf and it's 250 horsepower. Really good acceleration. Wow. So I would think it's him. Mm -hmm. And so the garage, you've um, you've gone down the route of for servicing electric cars as well. I was seeing that you're you have to. You specialized in that, I yeah. Think you'll have to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. No, well, that's fantastic. Well, we've got a lot of really good questions there. Um, I think we'll wrap up here tonight. Um, I think it's been, I've really enjoyed that tonight. It's been yeah, great well, to see a business going through. Yeah, I'm glad. I hope you all enjoyed it. And it's, it was good fun making it up. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Peter. Um, okay. Seeing a business like GW Tate, it's, uh, from the early stages, it's pretty special to see photos throughout the way. And also, mm -hmm. I think your photos had a lot of really, a lot of faces and a mm -hmm. lot of um, a lot of folk. And I think that's always interesting to see who's part of a business and yeah. see the folk that's been involved Absolutely, throughout yeah. the years. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think GW Tate's is, Obviously, farming, we're a community in Orkney, and I think we're extremely lucky to have a business like yourselves that we all work together. And I think um, it's, work together. Mm -hmm. it's absolutely a thing. I think as a community in Orkney, we are, uh, it's very easy to see the money coming in and then the money that's spread around. And it's great mm. to see a business that's there and that's well, we can all, all benefit and keep the agricultural mm -hmm. community mm -hmm. going. Um, so, no, thank you very much, Peter, okay. for doing this talk. That's great. Um, also, thank you very much tonight to. Thank you for watching. Yeah, mm -hmm. no problem at all. And thank you very much for him, Alison, as well, for uh, helping do all the admin yeah. and uh, to John Gottman as well. Um, so our next meeting is, oh, this is bad. I've forgotten the date, but it's uh, in December. It's on your email, so you should add the, add the date. And uh, it's worth North Eight, and it's going to be folks on IBR. So you'll be getting your link again. But um, yeah, any questions, give us a shout. Um, and in the meantime, thank you all very much for coming and have a safe journey home. Good night. Hello, hello. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>